In it, I lay out the revolutions in technology, in economics, in politics, and identity that are shaping the world today, and how revolutions throughout history shed light on our present moment. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Max Buda, columnist at the Washington Post. And today I'm pleased to be joined by my fellow Post columnist, Fareed Zakaria, to discuss Fareed's terrific new book, Age of Revolutions, Progress and Backlash from 1600 to the Present. I have to say, this is the book to read if you want to understand the turmoil that is gripping the world today and how we got here, and, and really to understand the last 400 years of history. It's a tour de force, and so I'm delighted to be able to talk to you about it today. Fareed, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you, Max. It's a huge pleasure to do this for the Post, and a very particular pleasure to to do it with with somebody who I have long admired, not just as a columnist, but as an author. I still remember your first great book, which was a huge revelation to me. Well, thank you very much, Fareed, and it's a pleasure for me, having been honored to be a guest on your on your CNN show a few times. I get to turn the tables and to and to put you on the on the hot seat now. Uh, so uh, we have a lot to cover. Let's jump right in. Uh, you've said that this book has taken you ten years to write. Talk about what you were seeing ten years ago. That would be 2014, when Barack Obama was still president, and nobody had any idea that. Uh, an unhinged real estate tycoon could possibly become president of the United States. What were you seeing in 2014 that provided the foundation uh, for this book? Yeah, it's a great question because I was sort of trying to remember and I read the original proposal to try to remind myself. So what was what what is happening at that point is that I'm beginning to notice that politics is getting kind of crazy and um, seems to be breaking from the familiar patterns of the past. So I was looking at the Tea Party, which was this strange grassroots movement of incredible intensity that was taking over the Republican Party or taking over a part of the Republican Party and particularly the base. And I remember reading a very powerful analysis by the Yale scholar Theta Scotchpole, which pointed out that while they would talk occasionally about it being a kind of small government uh, party that when you actually went out and surveyed them, you talked to them, and you did, you know, you you got into into got into the movement. You realized they were basically motivated by class resentment, racial resentment about Obama and the first black president, uh, hatred of immigrants. It was much more uh, centered around social issues. Uh, I remember noticing that by and by 2014, you really could get a good sense of this that. Obama was breaking a historical pattern which had existed for really ever since we had polling, which was that people's views of the economy would tend to be somewhat correlated to the actual strength of the economy and then very tightly correlated with presidential approval ratings. But the economy had recovered under Obama better than any other major economy since the global financial crisis. And yet his approval ratings didn't move much. You know, the stock market triples under Obama's presidency, and his approval ratings don't reflect that reality. So I'm looking at all this, and I remember reading an, uh, an, a lecture that uh, Tony Blair gave, in which he talked about how we were moving away from the politics of left versus right to a politics of open versus closed, meaning you know, openness, globalization, immigration, open markets, open technology platforms to closed uh, protectionism, anti-immigration, uh, all, all that kind of thing. And, and I realized, you know, there's something going on here. And I decided to write the book largely to educate myself and to try to understand, okay, if we are going through this kind of upending of politics, when was the last time something like this happened? And when has, and I began to realize that we've, we've had these moments when technology and economics really fundamentally upend the social structures and then the politics is sort of scrambling to make sense of it all. Well, as somebody who's primarily a historian myself, I love the way that you use a historical lens to try to understand what's going on. And you present a really fascinating series of case studies of pre uh, previous revolutions, some political, others technological and economic, 
beginning with the Netherlands uh, in the 1600s. And I thought that was an interesting choice because most of us are not that well versed in Dutch history. And when we think about the origins of liberty and we think about the foundations of the United States and the modern world order, most people don't look to the Netherlands, but you do. So maybe you can explain why why do you start with 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 the Dutch? Why were they so significant? And why how come there how come the Netherlands is not a superpower today? Um you know, I had exactly the reaction you did when I started to to look at this. I sort of generally sp was being thought of Britain as the place you would start. And then I read this fascinating book by Stephen Pincus, uh, who, who, a Yale scholar, called 1688. And it's about the glorious revolution in Britain that essentially creates the kind of modern liberal state, uh, liberal democratics oriented state uh, in Britain. And what the book made me realize is that almost all those British ideas actually were borrowed from the Dutch, who were the most successful uh, economy in Europe in the 17th century, the richest country in the world. And so I started to read more and more about it. And there's some great work that's been done by Simon Sharma and Jonathan Israel and people like that. And what I realized was that the Netherlands really is the first modern country. You know, if you think of the, the modern history being the break with thousands of years of stagnant GDP and the rise of, you know, kind of human prosperity and innovation and scientific, uh, 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 not, not just scientific, but engineering uh, innovation. It all begins around the 17th century with, with Holland, uh, with, with the Netherlands. And the reason is that it was this highly decentralized part of Europe, unlike the great landed empires of Europe, France, Spain, it did not have the feudal system because these were all a bunch of small uh, farmers and, and tradesmen who had to work together to reclaim the land, which was all swampy and you know not very arable. They, that kind of ega flat egalitarian decentralized structure allowed them to be much more innovative. In a weird way, it was sort of like, you know, think of the trust fund kids versus the hustlers who have nothing. The, the, the Dutch were the, the people who had nothing. And they innovated and they created this you know, they invented the tall ships that create globalization. They invent the joint uh, uh, stock corporation, which becomes the Dutch East India Company, which is the largest company in, in the world, create the Amsterdam stock market, which is the first stock market in the world. And that all of that creates the first merchant republic in the world. Before the Netherlands, really, you basically had uh, courts and kings. Politics was essentially a court affair. And the Netherlands, you start to get the modern idea of politics, which is interest groups, parties, things like that. And so in many ways, you know, the, the, the modern era begins with the Netherlands. And, you know, you say, why, why is it not a superpower? But let's just think about how since that time, that is the, really since 1600, even maybe the 1570s or so, the Netherlands has been in per capita GDP terms, one of the richest countries in the world for 500 years. Um, it has been essentially an uninterrupted uh, liberal Republican state and uh, soon a liberal democracy. If you look at the human, uh, the UN's uh, you know index of uh, of, of um, I forget what it's called, but you know it's the an index that looks at quality of life, uh, life expectancy, all those kind of things. Uh, the Netherlands has been in the top 10 ever since the index was founded. So it's an extraordinary run for a country of 17 million people. And that's the answer as to why they're not a superpower today. They're still, in per capita terms, amazingly productive. So the largest agricultural exporter in the world is the United States. Do you know the second largest agricultural exporter in the world is the Netherlands? Tiny okay. Netherlands. We're 340 million people. There are 17 million people. And of course, we're speaking to each other from a city that used to be known as New Amsterdam. Uh, so we, <laughs> exactly, we exactly the influence of the Dutch even here. Um, you quote Eric, Eric Hobsbawm uh, describing the Industrial Revolution as the most important event in world history, and that's a pretty sweeping statement. Why? Why is that the case? And what does the Industrial Revolution have to teach us about the current information revolution? So. I used Hobsbawm's uh, credibility to make that statement because it is such a breathtaking statement. Um, and I think you can think about it the most simply by looking at that graph that's in the that's in the book, which is average income of human beings 
from as far back as we can calculate it, which uh, there's, there's the great historian, uh, Angus Madison, who does it. And he goes back about 2,000 years. And it's basically a straight line. It's a flat line up to about, for 1,750 years, it's about a flat line. And then it just takes off in what we now call it, you know, the hockey stick graph. It just goes zoom. And the reason that happens is because of the Industrial Revolution. Per capita GDP has begun to rise in the Netherlands and then in Britain a, a bit before that. But what really drives it up is the Industrial Revolution. And so you have to think of the Industrial Revolution as the series of changes that took human beings for the first time out of subsistence uh, 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 levels of agri agriculture and nomadic existence into this world that we have become completely, um, we take for granted, which is of continuous growth. You know, the idea that we are going to every year grow, some people worry that it's only growing 2%, we're only growing 3%. Well, the fact that we're growing at all is a legacy of the Industrial Revolution. And we went, roughly speaking, from about in Europe, but in, in the West, from $400 per capita GDP in about the 15th century to about 4,000 by the beginning of the 20th century. You know, so a tenfold increase. And that has changed our lives. It's created, you know, people don't die of the infant mortality. People don't die of diseases. They have they eat two, at least two meals a day. They have a roof over their heads. You know, all those things, not to mention then the, you know, the, the inventions like electricity and things. So it's just, it is the mother of all revolutions, as I call it. Uh, and its impact, you know, has the, the shadow has lasted long, you know, far beyond. The reason I think it's relevant to our age, and you ask this, is the Industrial Revolution basically scrambled politics in very much the way the Information Age Revolution is doing. At the start of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the people in favor of the Industrial Revolution were liberals, the people on the left of, the, of center. They were for the merchants. They were for the, you know, the individual. The people against it were the conservatives because they represented land, agriculture, aristocracy, everything rooted in the old economic and political system and its, it, and its elites. And over time, what starts to happen is the, the, the two sides flip because the left begins to worry a lot about the distributional effects of industrial growth and capitalism, uh, creating this working class. And it starts thinking about more and more ways to alleviate the condition of the working class. And the right uh, becomes very comfortable with the new elite, the plutocratic elite, the, the new industrial uh, magnates, the robber barons in America. And so the right becomes pro-industry uh, capitalism markets, and the left becomes suspicious of them. You can see this actually in a guy I uh, very briefly profiled, John Stuart Mill, who begins his life as an ardent liberal and an ardent capitalist and ends his life as a socialist. Having laid the historical foundation, you then move on to describe that revolutions that are transforming the world today, globalization, technology, identity, geopolitics. And it strikes me that in a lot of ways, you can sum it all up with one word, which is backlash, kind of backlash against the economic and political changes that are sweeping the United States and so many other countries. What's interesting to me is that, you know, before we entered this era of backlash, we had this previous era of democracy and liberalism triumphant in the 1990s, this notion that Frank Fukuyama's notion that history had ended and we were all going to be good liberal capitalists. So, you know, what happened to that? Uh, why did we go so swiftly in the course of a few decades from this age of triumphalism in the 1990s to this age of, of backlash and, and liberal democracy uh, being on the defensive? It's a great question. And I, I, I think, you know, and I, and I, this is my speculation in the book. It was just too much change too fast um, in the sense that, you know, think about globalization. So if you look at in the 50s, the expansion of globalization, uh, a country like Japan essentially comes online into the global economy. And in the 60s, you probably say South Korea starts to come online and uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. In the 70s, maybe you would say Chile and, and uh, Malaysia. And then from the late 18, from the late 1980s to say 2005, 
you have almost all of Latin America, China, India, and large parts of Africa all coming online, uh, the, the Central and Eastern Europe. So basically somewhere between two and a half to three billion people suddenly join the, uh, the, the open world economy, the trading system. And that is a seismic shock to the system. Then look at the information revolution. I know there are big debates about exactly how big this revolution is compared to, say, you know, electricity and, and trains and telegraphs. What I would say is that the extraordinary thing about the information revolution is because it is about information and because it has been about communication, it is profoundly psychologically destabilizing. You know, think about Jonathan Haidt's work about what social media and the cell phone have done to people's, uh, you know, to rates of teen suicide and, and, and anxiety. I, I think that the truth is that what, whatever the economic effects of this, the social psychological effects of, a, of it, the information revolution are so disruptive to our sense of ourselves that I, I think that they, it really qualifies as a kind of mega revolution. So that happens. And then you have the identity revolution. You know, think about the role of women. Women have stayed second-class citizens for most of human history. Uh, you know, up, some tribe was up, some tribe was down, but women were always second-class citizens. And then in the last 30 to 40 years, that has fundamentally changed. So if you think about the change of that magnitude, it's probably not surprising that there is a big backlash because the, the changes are big. Well, how much of the backlash was driven by elites screwing up? Did the political class get things wrong? Or to what extent do you think the backlash was inevitable just because of the, of the nature of the technological and economic transformation that was going to happen anyway? Uh, I'd be curious for your take, because to me, it's, it's not clear. Yeah, it's a it's a very uh, in, interesting and pertinent question. Um, I tend to 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 think that this much change this fast was inevitably going to result in a backlash. I know that there is a there is a kind of view on uh, you know the, obviously there's a view on the right the the Steve Bannons of the world you know that the deep state and the and, and the kind of liberal and cosmopolitan elites have screwed everything up and that's why this happening. There's also a view on the kind of Bernie Sanders left uh, that it, it was the the corporate elites and their handmaidens in the in the Democratic Party and Labour Party in England that that hollowed out the working class. I, I really don't think that stands up to scrutiny and let me tell you why. First of all, look at Northern Europe. Uh, you know, whatever we may have gotten wrong, the place that people, the Bernie Sanders left, for example, idealizes is Scandinavian countries and Northern Europe in general. Well, the, you know, and, they, and inequality has not risen much in those countries, for example. You've not had a hollowing out of the working class, uh, even in a place like Germany. You have right-wing populism everywhere. Sweden has as its second largest party, a party that derives from the, from the 1930s fascist experience. Uh, the, the Netherlands has this xenophobic uh, party that Gert Wilders uh, runs, and Gert Wilders is essentially the most popular politician in, in the Netherlands right, right now. Uh, Germany, which has long had a taboo on right-wing parties because of, because of its history with, with the Nazis, has now the AFD, which is a, you know, full, a full-blown uh, right-wing populist party. Um, but also, I don't buy the the idea that the United States uh, screwed up as as badly as it did. It could have done better on distributional issues. It should have it should have distributed more. We should have taxed more and spent more on on the on the kind of the losers and all of this. But let me just remind uh, viewers and listeners of this: the eurozone economy and the U.S. economy in 2008 were the same size. The U.S. economy is, I think, now 60 percent larger than the eurozone economy. If Great Britain were to join the United States as the 51st state, it would be the 51st poorest state in the American Union. Per capita income, average income in Britain is lower than that of Mississippi. So we haven't done that badly in the last 20 or 25 years, even distributionally. If you, look, if you take into account income transfers, that is unemployment insurance, Social Security, Medicare, and all that, you, you have not had stagnation of middle class income. Um, what we have had is deep cultural change. In 1975, 5% of America was foreign born. It's now 15%. In, in 1975, 
about 4% of Sweden was foreign born. It's now 22%. You know, those are the changes. That, that's where you see the real change. And, you know, I think that's what affects people much more deeply is this sense of cultural uh, alienation and cultural change. I think one of the interesting arguments you make is basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're basically suggesting that kind of our, our current obsession with identity politics is kind of a luxury good, which has been enabled by the overall prosperity of our society that we are... Uh, you know, we're having our material needs taken care of, and so we're able to become agitated about non-material factors, including this identity politics, this identity backlash uh, against the the changing demographics of our society. I mean, is, is that an accurate summation of your of your view? Entirely accurate. There's a great uh, a social scientist named Ronald Inglehart who ran a, a, a kind of survey pro a process. It involved many, many scholars, and, and, and they looked at dozens of countries. And what they found was two very interesting things that I'll point out. One, exactly as you say, that as countries got richer, uh, what ended up happening is that people's core political identity, which used to be defined by economics, starts to move. And what they start to do is people start expressing what he described as post-materialistic values. Or if you think of you know, Maslow's hierarchy, you first worried about food and shelter, and then you start to think about other things, you know, like community and identity. So it, it, that's a very, that, that process tracks almost perfectly with what the 1940s and 50s, when countries were coming out of the Great Depression in the West, it was all about economics. And by the 70s, when you have some basic level of, uh, of income assured, you're kind of a mass middle class, people start to think about their identities as women, as blacks, as Hispanics, as gay, as, as lesbian, whatever it is. Uh, and that this process has happened pretty much throughout the world. That's the very interesting part about it. Um, and the second part I, I, a point I'd make about, about Engelhardt's work, which I found fascinating, uh, this is in the last five years, his last work, uh, was that America was always this unusual um, country in the World Values Survey. We were almost alone among rich countries in that our on values relating to, let's call it colloquially, the three Gs, gays, guns, and God, you know, social values. We were closer to Nigeria than we were to Denmark. In the last five to 10 years, the United States has seen the single largest drop in religiosity of any country in the last 20 or 30 years. So we have become radically more secular. We are becoming, in that sense, more like Denmark. And the reason I bring this up is it would, again, explain why there has been such a backlash. People are, you know, what people forget is if that is happening, if that trend is real, and he provides mountains of evidence that it is, um, it gets a lot of people worried that their world is disappearing, that the world they knew is disappearing, that they are, you know, that the kids are being taught new and alien and uh, ideologies that are kind of, you know, unmoored from the past. What's the biggest challenge uh, that the U.S. faces going forward? Is it the challenge from external adversaries, from the Chinas, Russias, Irans, North Koreas, et cetera? Or is it the challenge uh, from our internal disunity, from the rise of the MAGA Republicans, from misinformation, polarization, all these other trends. And of course, in this book, you look at both of those, but which one do you, you see as being the biggest threat to our future? They're, they're both challenges. There's no question that the rise of a kind of illiberal China and an illiberal Russia and an illiberal Iran are very real problems. And, they are, and those countries see themselves as an ideological opposition to the West, not just geopolitical opposition. But we're very strong. Uh, you know this this well, Max, because you've been writing about it. I mean, the United States is still the strongest country in the world by far on in economic measures. We're demographically healthy because of uh, because of our immigration. Uh, you know, we produce more energy than we produce more oil than Saudi Arabia, more natural gas than Qatar. No, our problem largely, our biggest weakness is at home. We have this completely dysfunctional politics and. Look, I don't want to get too partisan, but we are, you know, the reality is we are facing a, a very consequential election uh, in, the, in, in, the, in November in which we have the only president in American history who tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power and not just tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power and forget what happened outside with the crowds on January 6th. 
which in my opinion was much less important than what happened inside the Capitol, Donald Trump was able to convince a majority of House Republicans to vote against the peaceful transfer of law, to decertify an election that 50 states had certified and 50 court decisions had upheld. Up against that, we have a regular politician, a regular liberal democratic politician. You may like his policies or don't like his policies, but that's what's at stake. Um, and I think if we go down one of one of those two paths, I, I do think it's it's very consequential to what happens to us. Not you know not just in terms of policy. Yes, we'll let down Ukraine and we'll let a, an illiberal, nasty Russia uh, imperialism get rewarded. But it's but it's what happens to the the character, the fundamental character of liberal democracy in America and being the leading liberal dem democracy in the world. What message that sends the whole world. I mean, I think it's fair to say that the tenor of your book is is kind of cautiously optimistic, that you still have faith in America, you still have faith in the vitality of liberalism. But what does it say? I mean, talking about Trump, what does it say that he is neck and neck with with Biden after having been, uh, you know, uh, indicted on so many criminal counts, 91, after having been impeached twice, and after having, you know, come out as such a, a, a clear uh, uh, opponent of our liberal constitutional system, somebody, as you say, who incited an insurrection, and he could very well win the presidency. So why, I mean, why, why, despite that, do you still have kind of confidence in, in, in liberal democracy? Look, I, I, you know, you're asking the, the, a very tough question because I have I've always assumed that Trump, that Trump and Trumpism was a kind of phase that would that would pass. And it's not passing. Um, and it's to me, at some level, I have to confess, kind of unfathomable because it's not even really a political movement. It's a cult. It's a personality cult. Look at the last presidential uh, uh, national Republican National Convention uh, in 2020. The, 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 there was no party platform. The party platform was a paragraph that said, whatever Donald Trump says is the Republican Party platform, that is our party platform. First time in history. The, no, there was not a single former Republican presidential nominee or president even invited to the convention. Uh, and instead, five members of the Trump family were given primetime speaking so slots. You know, this is a this is a cult. This is a party cult. Uh, I mean, a family cult, not a party. So I, the fact that it endures, the fact that, you know, anything he says, no matter how untruthful, uh, um, Kind of you know gains traction with his with his uh, with his flock, the fact that you know Truth Social this this company he started, you know the, the, everybody's buying a piece of it. All his followers are buying a piece of it, even though it has three million dollars in revenues. Um, you know I mean it's just crazy. The company is worth eight billion dollars with three million dollars in revenues. So it has a price to sales ratio of two thousand. When you, which when you compare it to its competitors, the, their price to sales ratios are something in the range of 10 and 15. You know, so there's something going on here that obviously we're all not understanding, but I would say it's, it is this deep cultural sense of uh, unease with the world we're going into, a multicultural world in which women have rights and which gay people's identities are openly, uh, you know, to not just tolerated, but celebrated. Uh, you know, a world of open technology, open, you know, with much greater trade with other countries. It's all that stuff, as Tony Blair said, all that openness leaves a lot of people saying, I want to shut it all down, you know, stop the world, I want to get off. And what, what Trump promises them is that he is going to take them back, you know, to some kind of mythical period, I assume some version of the 1950s, where America was more stable, more white, more male dominated. Uh, it's all a fantasy, of course, but that seems to be the one people prefer to to a reality that I think is actually quite quite amazing. America today, to me, the most interesting thing is they think of themselves as a party of patriotism and they hate everything about modern America. Um, and I think you know, I look at a modern America and I think it's a, it's an amazing place. I, I, I echo that sentiment. This has been a fascinating conversation. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Fareed, thank you so much for joining us on Washington Post Live. Max, a privilege to do this with you. Thank you.
I look forward to your Reagan book. I hope I hope we can turn the tables for that one. I look forward to that as well. And thanks to all of you for joining us as well. For more of these important conversations, sign up for a Washington Post subscription. Get a free trial by visiting WashingtonPost.com backslash live. I'm Max Boot. Thank you again.